Welcome, my friends. Today we will be discuss discussing the idiopathic inflammatory myopathies or myositis. Classically, one thinks of dermatomyositis or polymyositis. However, there are several others. This is a very group of condition with respect to muscle disease pathology and the extra muscle involvement. So I've been putting off making this talk. These conditions can have profound effects on the patient if left untreated, leading to a patient that is wheelchair ridden or bed ridden, can lead to respiratory failure and possibly death. So it is important to recognize these. Recognized and properly treated, the patients generally do very well. As always, this is a part of a series of rheumatology lectures for sophomore medical students. Click on the introduction to rheumatology bo listed below to see my other lectures. Thank you, and I hope you learned something. Today we will be discussing the idiopathic inflammatory myopathies, which comprises the conditions dermatomyositis, polymyositis, inclusion body myositis, immune-mediating necrotizing myopathy, antisynthetase syndrome, and overlap syndromes. Briefly stated, these are a group of diseases of the muscle, inflammatory diseases of the muscle characterized by a non-separative inflammation and proximal muscle weakness. They're heterogeneous, and that means there are several different things, and we discuss those in the title slide. When there's a characteristic rash, it's called dermatomyositis, and they're idiopathic, which means we really don't know the cause. Now, as with all the diseases, or most of the diseases we discuss in rheumatology, they are felt to be immune-mediated. And as with the other diseases that we discuss, there is felt to be a genetic predisposition and then something in the environment that sets it off. Now, in discussing the, these diseases, I think that it would be best for me to discuss each specific entity, and then we'll sort of lump them together to discuss the approach diagnosis, therapy. I'm going to start with the most, probably the most common of these, which is dermatomyositis. And basically, this is muscle disease, inflammatory muscle disease associated with a characteristic rash. Now, the rash characteristically affects the eyelids, the cheeks, eyelids, the cheeks, the bridge of the nose. It can affect the forehead. It's just another example where it affects the forehead. You can see it on the cheeks and the bridge of the nose. It can affect the front and the back of the chest. This is involvement of the knees, and again you see sort of this reddish placky skin. When it involves the dorsum of the finger joints, the knuckles, we get these sort of the pink sort of placky lesions over the DIPs, PIPs, and MCPs. These are known as Gotrin's papules. This is just another example. These are more red, and again, you see the redness, the flake over the knuckles. Sometimes the skin, especially the eyelids, can become very bright purple, sort of the color of the heliotrope flower, and this is called a heliotrope rash. The skin can sometimes become shiny and atrophic and edematous, somewhat like scleroderma. There are are characteristic capillary nail changes. And what one sees here, if you look, is there's dilation of the capillaries and dropout. Usually I'll put like a drop of microscope oil on the cuticle and then view it with some sort of a magnifying lens. And when we see this, one again sees capillary dilation, capillary dropout. This is somewhat pathognomonic for dermatomyositis and for scleroderma. So when one sees this, you need to think dermatomyositis or scleroderma. There's also a condition called antisynthetase syndrome, which can be associated with mechanics hands, which is the skin of the hands becomes very sort of dry and cracked, sort of like somebody that's working in solvents a lot. Calcinosis can occur, but this tends to occur more often in childhood dermatomyositis. It's an increased risk of cancer associated with the inflammatory myopathies, in particular dermatomyositis. 
With respect to dermatomyositis, it can be a so the, the incidence is five to seven times the normal population and affects women more often than men. This can occur any time around the diagnosis within two years, although with ovarian cancer this can occur up to five years after presentation. There are antibodies that seem to have an increased risk of cancer associated, including the anti-transcription factor 1 gamma, or anti-TIF1 gamma, which seems to be associated with an increased risk of ovarian breast cancer, and also the anti-NXP2 is associated with malignant, increased risk of malignancy in adults. Now the type of cancers that are involved are sort of mirror the population with an excess of cervical, lung, ovarian, pancreatic, bladder, and gastric cancers, and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Now, the antibodies that we see associated with dermatomyositis include the antinuclear antibody, which occurs in up to 80% of the patients. The anti-MI2 antibody seems to be associated with an increased or a rapid onset of dermatomyositis. We already talked about the NXP2 being associated with an increased risk of adult cancer, and in children, dermatomyositis, there is an increased incidence or risk of calcinosis. The MDA5 antibody tends more often to be associated with amyopathic disease, and basically amyopathic disease is the skin condition we see associated with dermatomyositis without the inflammatory muscle disease. There does seem to be increased risk of interstitial lung disease, though, if this antibody is present. Anti-JO1 is associated with the antisynthetase syndrome, which is a combination of myositis and lung disease, and we did talk about mechanic hands. And then the anti-SAE antibody seems to be associated with increased risk of dysphagia. And in this condition, the skin changes may precede the, the myopathy. Now, what do we see pathologically in dermatomyositis? It is associated with an immune complex deposition around the vessels, and there's also a cellular deposition around the vessels, and perifascicularly, we do not see it so much in the muscle fascicles themselves. And that's what we're seeing here. If you can see, there's this, and these are primarily lymphocytes, B lymphocytes, and to the extent there's T lymphocytes, there's an increased ratio of CD4 to CD8. See them around the vessels here, around the fascicles, but not so much in the fascicles. You also see damage to the muscle fibers, which you can see sort of these ghosts of uh, dead muscle fibers in here. There's a lot of necrosis and phagocytosis. There may be, the, the muscle fibers that remain may be hypertrophy in order to make up for the lost muscle that's been affected by the inflammation. So there's variation in fiber size. And then the, the dead tissue, the dead muscle is replaced by connective tissue and fat. How this progresses or the pathophysiology of this, innate immunity seems to play a role. The membrane attack complex C5B through 9 seems to be involved early and there's an increase in interferon 1. Now interestingly in ju juvenile dermatomyositis there's thought to be maternal chimeric cells that may contribute and basically this is, this is a chimera from Greek mythology and what that is is you have the, the body of one organism with the head of other organisms. In human chimera that's an individual that has two different genetic sources of the cells in their body. Most often, in particular in juvenile dermatomyositis, some maternal cells may be in the body and they may cause a graft versus host type of disease. This also can occur, is also felt to be one of the reasons people get scleroderma. Well, how often does dermatomyositis occur and who does it affect? The typical prevalence is about 1 in 100,000, which really this is a rare disease, indeed is felt to be an orphan disease. It tends to affect women more often than men, 
and the peak age is around the fifth decade, although any age can be involved, and there is an entity that we've discussed and we'll discuss some more called juvenile dermatomyositis. The special subsets of this condition include, as we mentioned, juvenile dermatomyositis. This has a greater association with calcinosis. There is no association increase with cancer, which is different than adult. And as we mentioned, the, the NXP2 antibody is associated with increased risk of calcinosis, but again, not cancer. Another special subset is amyopathic dermatomyositis. And basically, this is the rash with no muscle involvement. And again, we discuss how with the MDA5 antibody, there seems to be an increased risk of amyopathic disease and interstitial lung disease. Next, let's discuss polymyositis basically is an inflammatory myositis without the rash of dermatomyositis. The classification of just pure polymyositis is decreasing as there's a recognition of other types of inflammatory myopathies such as antisynthetase syndrome, immune-mediated necrotizing myopathy, inclusion body myositis, and overlap myositis. Pathologically, the, the involvement or the inflammation is different than dermatomyositis. We talked about how in dermatomyositis, the inf inflammation tends to be more perifasicularly and perivascularly. In this, the inflammation can actually be in the muscle fibers. But as with dermatomyositis, we'll get cell death, we'll get cell atrophy, and there'll be variation of fiber sizes the muscle fibers that are remain hypertrophy to make up for the muscle fibers that are gone. Next, antisynthetase syndrome. And basically, this is an inflammatory myopathy associated with characteristic antisynthetase antibodies. There's a host of these, but primarily we look for anti-JO1. talked about MDA5 already. The Sjogren's antibodies, SSA and SSB, have sometimes been associated. And again, there's multiple other antibodies that can be associated. This is muscle disease associated with interstitial lung disease and mechanics hands. And we talked about that. They can have Raynaud's, inflammatory arthritis, and fevers. There does seem to be severe lung disease that can be associated, but not an increased risk of cancer. Now, overlap syndrome is myositis that can occur with other autoimmune diseases. And this means things such as systemic lupus or scleroderma. Less commonly, we see that with rheumatoid or Sjogren's syndrome. Mixed connective tissue disease is a special subset of this. This is associated with the antinuclear antibody, which is an extractable antinuclear antibody called antiribonucleoprotein or anti-RMP. And typically, these patients will have characteristics of two of three autoimmune diseases, polymyositis, scleroderma, and systemic lupus. And you, you may see a patient with characteristics of scleroderma and polymyositis, lupus and polymyositis, or, of course, lupus and scleroderma. With respect to the scleroderma overlap, there can be a mild inflammatory myopathy in scleroderma where the CK and the aldolase are only mildly elevated. They tend not to get profound functional changes of the muscles because of this. They're often associated with the anti-PMSCL antibody, the U3-RMP antibody, and the anti-CU antibody. Let's next discuss immune-mediating necrotizing myopathy. This is an inflammatory myopathy that presents like polymyositis. There is no rash. The CPK muscle enzyme can be very high. And histologically, what we see is not much inflammation, not many lymphocytes, but there are macrophages, and there's marked muscle necrosis and regeneration. And again, what we see in this slide is, again, not a lot of inflammatory infiltrate, certainly not lymphocytes. There may be some macrophages present. And and it's not seen so much in this side, but again, there's necrosis and regeneration. There are characteristic antibodies associated with immune-mediated necrotizing myopathy, in particular the HGMCR antibody and the SRP antibody are associated. In this condition, there are, does seem to be 
at least some clues of a genetic basis. There's an increase of the major histocompatibility allele DRB1, and there does seem to be at least some things that can set this off. This can follow statin therapy, but it's different than the usual statin myopathy. The typical statin myopathy patients will have a mild elevation of CPK enzyme, the statin will be withdrawn, and the, my and the CK will return to normal. In this condition, the CPKs can go very high, and even after withdrawal of the statin drug, the inflammation and the damage can progress. The last subset that I would like to discuss before we move on to the general discussion is inclusion body myositis. This tends to affect people that are older, usually greater than 40. The onset is somewhat insidious and progression slow. It can take five to six years till diagnosis. There can be proximal and distal involvement. Indeed, the distal involvement is one of the hallmarks of this. The muscle enzymes are not really markedly elevated, and the response to treatment, in particular corticosteroids, but other therapies, is very poor. This is just an example of some of the pathology, and what we see in here is there is some tissue necrosis. You see what we call the characteristic ring vacuoles in here. Again, we see some inflammation, but not a lot. Again, you see the ring vacuole right here, which is a characteristic of this. This is an amyloid deposit, and this is a Congo red stain. So one can see amyloid deposits in these. Uh, amyloid deposits are also what we typically see in the brain with Alzheimer's disease. And with electron microscopy, there's a lot of intracytoplasmic uh, inclusions and intranuclear inclusions, and thus the name inclusion body myositis. Let's start with the general discussion at this point. So clinically, what we see is primarily proximal muscle weakness, and we'll talk about confrontation testing in a minute. They can have esophageal involvement with dysphagia. It's very important to quiz the patients about function, as this will give us a clue that this is going on. So I ask patients about difficulty rising from chairs, and indeed when I start my physical, I watch them get out of a chair. I ask them about reaching over their head and getting things down from a cabinet, as that can be a problem. Can they raise their head off the pillow? How do they do getting out of bed? These are all queried about. Again, with respect to the examination, I look for the characteristic rash. On confrontation testing, I work to grade the muscle strength. And this is from the Medical Research Council, and this is a grading scale that I use where 5 is normal power and 0 is no contraction of the muscle at all. With respect to 4, that's decreased but resistance possible, and that's somewhat subjective in the measurement by the examiner. Obviously, the amount of power that is less for a young, healthy male is much greater than the amount of power that is less for an elderly female. Three, the patient can hold the extremity against gravity, but if any pressure is placed on the extremity, it will drop. Two, the, the patient can move the extremity, but only without raising it against gravity. One, one can see the muscle contract, but there is no movement of the joint, and of course zero, there's no contraction at all. I will now demonstrate the physical examination. Confrontation testing is a strength test with the patient. The physician pushes as hard as he can, and the patient pushes as hard as she can, like arm wrestling. We start with neck flexion and extension, shoulder abduction, arm flexion or biceps, and arm extension or triceps, which is not demonstrated, wrist extension and flexion, grip strength. Note that I only offer the patient two fingers. They cannot hurt you if they only have two fingers. Hip flexion, knee extension or quadriceps, 
plantar flexion and dorsiflexion of the feet. I also evaluate standing from sitting. Note in the second example how she needs to rock and use her arms in order to recruit other muscles to aid in standing. This is a sign of weakness. I also look to see how well the patient does a sit up. Grading strength. 5 over 5 is normal. That is, the patient can generate as much power as you would expect somebody that age and habitus to produce. 4 over 5, they still have some power, but it is not normal. This is very subjective. 3 over 5, the patient can raise the extremity against gravity, but is not able to resist an applied force. 2 over 5, the extremity may not be lifted or moved against gravity, but can be moved without or where there is not gravity resisting motion. 1 over 5, one can see the muscle twitch, but there is no movement of the joint. Other things to watch for. Dysphagia can be a particular problem with the inflammatory myopathies. This involves the voluntary proximal muscles, the, the esophagus. And this can be a problem because it can lead to reflux and pulmonary problems. And as we discussed, pulmonary problems from other causes are a big part of this, but it also can occur from reflux. If this is a concern, the patients need to be seen by speech therapy evaluated. They may require special procedures by speech therapy, or they may even require a feeding tube. Heart disease or cardiac disease can occur in up to 70% of the patients. This can present as either conduction blocks, it may just be minor inner S non-specific STT wave changes on EKG. Sometimes one might just see a, a, a tachycardia. Indeed, I had one patient that was the only way she presented with heart involvement as her heart rate would, would go up and would require therapy. There can be tachycardia and extrasystoles. We talked a bit about lung disease when we were talking about the antisynthetase syndrome and the antibodies that can be associated with this. Interstitial lung disease can occur in up to 10 to 50 percent of the patients and can occur, as we talked about with the MDA5, can occur more often, can occur with a normal CPK. The anti jo one is associated with the antisynthetase syndrome, which involves myopathy and lung disease in the mechanic's hands. There's several histiologic types of of lung involvement, which I list here and won't repeat. Sometimes they can have infections as a cause of the lung disease. They're at risk to this due to either dysphagia with reflux or they, because of respiratory muscle weakness, they can't clear their lungs, they can't cough. Also, the medicines that we use can cause lymphocytopenia and the corticosteroids and the other immunosuppressive therapy can just uh, suppress the immune system. Some of the medicines that we use to treat this, in particular methotrexate or cyclophosphamide, can be associated with lung disease. So the workup that I consider in this condition includes a chest x-ray, possibly a high resolution CT, pulmonary function tests, and in this by pulmonary function tests I include lung volumes and diffusing capacity, not just flow volumes. Typically, I'll follow a chest x-ray and pulmonary function test at intervals in these patients. Now, we talked about the other associated condition, which is cancer. As we mentioned, this can occur in up to seven times the normal population, dermatomyositis, or 15% of patients. In polymyositis, it's less so, but still greater than the normal population. We talked about already how that it can occur within two years before, during, or after diagnosis. However, with ovarian cancer, it can be much later. And we talked about how the cancers parallel the normal population. Now, what I would consider reasonable malignancy workup, again, a very complete and careful history and physical examination, including breast, rectal, and pelvic exam. If you don't want to do it, you need to get somebody else to do it. 
I'll look at the blood count, the sed rate, the liver function test, calcium, urine, and chest x-ray. Stool hemocults or colonoscopy will be done, mammography, and then pelvic ultrasound and a CA-125. And these should be repeated every two to three years. And again, ovarian malignancies can occur up to five years following. One thing one might want to consider is abdominal CT for pancreatic cancer. And also remember that the TIF1 gamma and the NXP2 can be associated with an increased risk of cancer. Now with respect to the workup for the inflammatory myopathy or myositis, I do favor muscle enzymes. Indeed, these are oftentimes how the disease is detected, including the CPK and the aldolase. But remember that the liver enzymes SGOT and SGPT are also muscle enzymes, likewise the LDH. So these need to be checked for and watched. I've had cases where patients presented with elevated, quote, liver enzymes, and they did not have liver disease, they had muscle disease. Also look at the sedimentation rate for inflammation. We talked about the antinuclear antibody, how it can be associated in a spec, and in particular the extractable nuclear antigens such as RMP can be associated with conditions such as mixed connective tissue disease and also the rheumatoid factor. The EMG has characteristic findings and also can help in differentiating from neuromuscular disease. However, as we'll discuss when we talk about other things that can raise CPK, I would do this on one side so we can biopsy the other. I might do the right arm and right leg and not the left. Findings on EMG include short, small polyphasic motor units, there are fibrillations, there's positive sharp waves, there's increased irritability with insertion of the needles, and there's high frequency repetitive discharges. So there's certain findings that the uh, EMG physician, the neurologist finds that can help at least classify an inflammatory myopathy. An MRI can help direct muscle biopsy, as there's findings in the muscle with MRI. Muscle biopsy is very important, in particular if there's not skin disease, to help identify and classify and also confirm the diagnosis and to, to try to rule out other types of diseases of the muscle that can be causing the problems. We already talked about the cancer workup and it's important to evaluate for other autoimmune diseases. Now, the myositis specific antibodies, again, I list these here also. I've already discussed these. I think these are probably more important once the diagnosis has of inflammatory myopathy is made to try to at least classify and give a heads up as to associated conditions that can occur. Let's talk about the differential diagnosis. And in doing that, I want to start with a discussion of pivot point. It's been found that master diagnosticians, when they go to approach a case, will look for what they call a pivot point, a finding or findings about which they can build their differential diagnosis. And what one picks as a pivot point can affect Number one, whether the diagnosis is found. I've always had a saying that if you don't think about it, you won't make the diagnosis. And if it's too broad, it can lead you down too many pathways and make diagnosis very difficult, very expensive, and just not help. For instance, fatigue is a lousy pivot point. If patient presents with fatigue, because anything or nothing can cause fatigue patient presents with cough and fever, cough and fever might be a very good pivot point because there are a limited number of diagnoses that can cause that. In addition, with respect to diagnosis, I think that it's important to keep reconsidering the diagnosis even after one has made it, after one has made the diagnosis because the patient changes, the disease progresses, and there's more information. And I always tell patients that I reserve the right to change my mind. Now, with weakness as one's pivot point, one needs to consider three broad classes. One is functional weakness, and this occurs in patients that are just generally debilitated with things such as heart disease or cancer or anemia 
chronic infections or chronic other inflammatory diseases, uh, deconditioning or even depression. Can, that is sort of sorted out with the history and physical. The next broad category is anything proximal to the muscle causing weakness, the neuro neuromuscular system. This can include the brain and things such as strokes, the spinal cord, such as damage to the spinal cord or tumors or demyelinating disease, such as multiple sclerosis, or something impinging on the spinal cord, such as osteophytes from uh, osteoarthritis. Working down the nervous system, there can be anterior horn disease, such as occurs with polio or lead poisoning. The peripheral nerves, they can have a peripheral neuropathy, such as occurs in Guillain-Barre or drug toxicity or heavy metal exposure, or mononeuropathy, such as occurs in diabetes mellitus or periarthritis nodosum. And then at the neuromuscular junction, one consider myasthenia gravis, um, organophosphate pro poisoning, etc. So again, if looking at the, the nervous system proximal to the muscle, there's a lot of different things one needs to consider. But if one can isolate through one's physical and examination, and again, we even talked about the EMG that is in the muscle, this yields a much smaller differential diagnosis. Now, if we consider the conditions that just affect the muscles or myopathy, the differential is much smaller, but again, still rather large. Inflammatory is the diseases that can affect the muscles we're discussing. That's the purpose of this talk. Endocrine diseases that can affect the muscle, things such as hypothyroid, hypothyroidism, or Cushing syndrome need to be considered. Indeed, when we talk about the lab test workup, perhaps TSH should be added. Cushing syndrome, these are patients with increased endogenous cortisone production or even exogenous, such as people that are treated with corticosteroids like we use to treat the inflammatory myopathies. Electrolyte abnormalities such as low potassium, low sodium, low phosphate, low calcium can all be associated with muscle weakness. The metabolic myopathies are actually inborn areas of metabolism. These are disorders of carbohydrate or lipid or purine metabolism, such as McArdle's disease. Toxins such as cocaine, heroin, alcohol, we talked about corticosteroids, colchicine such as we use to treat gout, uh, antimalarial such as we use to treat lupus or rheumatoid can all be associated with myopathies. The HMA uh, re CoA reductase inhibitors or the statin drugs can be associated and so all those need to be considered and a good drug history needs to be taken. Infections such as the viral infections such as Coxsackie or influenza or parainfluenza, HIV, CMV, etc. Polio can affect the muscles although polio probably is more at the proximal in the nervous system Lyme disease can sometimes affect the muscles, and there can be parasitic involvement with things such as toxoplasmosis or trichinosis. And then lastly, rhabdomyolysis, and, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. So this is all the differential diagnosis if we use as a pivot point weakness, if we use as the pivot point CPK elevated CPK muscle enzymes. Again, this re reveals a very large differential diagnosis and basically very much the same as what we came up when we just considered myopathies as our differential diagnoses. So we did talk about these, but infectious myopathies, we also include uh, bacterial pyomyositis, the muscular dystrophies. Now, rhabdomyolysis is a special condition. This can occur after a crush injury or seizures, alcoholic delirium tremens, if there's exertion under heat or stress, vascular surgery, or like with anesthetics, general anesthetics, they can have a malignant hyperthermia. And what one sees in rhabdomyolysis is that there's an incredible large elevation of the CK muscle enzyme. It's usually of limited duration, but the risk in rhabdomyolysis is that there's a danger to the kidney and these patients need to be treated with very aggressive hydration.
in order to protect the kidney. We also already talked about the metabolic myopathies and endocrine associated disease, periodic paralysis, which is another uh, genetic disease can be associated. Post-exercise, the CKs can go up. So one can see an elevation of the CK just with exercise. Iatrogenic injections into the muscle can raise the CK. So it's important not to check that right after giving them the patient a shot. The EMG likewise, we're sticking needles in the muscles to do the EMG and that can raise the CK. And of course, surgeries. Some of the motor neuron diseases such as amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, can be associated with eleva elevated CKs. We talk about how trauma can increase the CK. G certain genetic populations, such as blacks greater than whites, can have an elevation that is CK. And likewise, muscular people seem to have more involvement than less muscular people. So if you think about it, you have a muscular young football player who probably has an underlying elevation of CK versus the regular population plays football on a Saturday, comes in on a Monday, maybe after exertion also. You can see their CKs can go very high, and yet that doesn't necessarily represent disease. One needs to just wait and see what happens with it. Last thing on this list is myocardial infarction. Remember that the CPK is one of the enzymes that it's looked for in trying to make the diagnosis of myocardial infarction. Now let's talk about classification. Remember classification is the things that are looked for in order to classify a disease in order that the patients can be included in studies. However, I think it, I find it useful to think about classification of disease when I think about diagnoses because that can help us in making the diagnoses. We're going to talk about two different classification criteria. First we'll talk about the classic criteria of Bowen and Peter, and these are the criteria that were used for many years until just recently. Basically, Bowen and Peter suggested considering five different criteria, symmetric proximal muscle weakness, elevated muscle enzymes, a characteristic EMG or electromyelogram, we talked about what that is, characteristic muscle biopsy, and we've talked about what that is, and the typical rash of dermatomyositis. Now, they were not considering the whole menu of diagnoses that we have today. Some of these dis diseases weren't described yet or discussed yet. They considered basically polymyositis, dermatomyositis, dermatomyositis, or polymyositis with neoplasia, with neoplasia childhood dermatomyositis or polymyositis, and overlap syndrome. So they were considering these five different things when they made their classification criteria. And then using these criteria, they would classify whether one had definite, probable, or possible disease. Now, if you look at these five criteria, in order to classify as polymyositis, one needs four criteria. And basically, if you look at these criteria, that's all the criteria except for the rash. If they don't have a rash, they're saying they need all of their criteria in order to classify as definite. However, if they do have the rash or dermatomyositis, they only need two of the three criteria. So this is this was Bowen and Peter's criteria. Now, in 2017, the European League Against Rheumatism, or ULAR, and the American College of Rheumatology published a new classification system. This is listed here and basically it's a weighted system. They had a weighting of the system with, with patients that had muscle biopsy and they had a weighting of the system with patients that did not, that did not have muscle biopsy. And then so they would go through these criteria listed here and then they would, they had, they would apply the, these graphs to come up with a probability that the patient had the condition in which they were trying to classify them for the studies. So this all looks very daunting and difficult to use, but there's a nice way to do this. And there's this website, and again, this is included in my lecture notes that can be used to go through this classification criteria. This time, let's try a young person, less than 17, Again, they do have some weakness of the proximal lower extremities. 
neck muscles don't seem to be different. The proximal muscles seem to be weaker than the distal muscles. They do have a heliotrope rash with Gottron's papules. Um, there's no esophageal dysmotility. They do not have um, a JO1 antibody. Their muscle enzymes are elevated. They're, they do have perimyceal and perifasicular infiltration of the cells. There's some atrophy and there's no room vacuoles. And let's see what they have. Again, 100% probability of inflammatory idiopathic myopathy. This would be classified as juvenile dermatomyositis. So one could see how this can be very helpful in trying to classify and even to use to make the diagnosis. Let's talk about treatment of this disease. The, one of the course, cornerstones of initial therapy has been corticosteroids. And, and in high dose, especially if there's already functional compromise. So typically, I would start prednisone on the order of one milligram per kilogram per day, usually in a divided dose. This would be on the order of 60, 80, 60 to 80 milligrams per day. They may not be helpful in inclusion body myositis. For patients that are severely compromised, and indeed progressing to, to the point where they have respiratory compromise or bedridden, I will even consider a course of pulse corticosteroids, methylprednisolone, sodium succinate, one gram IV daily for three days. So anyway, we'll start high doses of corticosteroids. Usually in conjunction with that, I'll start a disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drug, either methotrexate or azathioprine. Remember with methotrexate that it can sometimes affect the lungs, so in patients where I'm concerned about an antisynthetase syndrome, I will avoid that. With respect to azathioprine, I would check a TPMT just to make sure they can metabolize the drug. Now, if they don't respond to that, or if I can't use those, I'll consider mycophenolate mofetil. This was classically or traditionally a drug use for patients that have had organ transplants, but I found I have found it very useful in the treatment of the inflammatory myopathies and systemic lupus erythematosus. The calcineuron inhibitors, including tacromelis and cyclosporin, I've used some cyclosporin, haven't had a lot of good success with that. My experience was usually I found the creatinine would rise or they would have an increase of the blood pressure and I'd have to quit it. Intravenous immunoglobulin or IVIG, this is actually the only treatment approved by the FDA for the treatment of dermatomyositis. So this is the only treatment approved. The problem with this, this is very expensive. Typically the patients require very high doses on the order of two grams per kilogram over the course of two to five days and given monthly. This yields a cost of about $14,000 to $49,000 per each course of therapy. Again, it's used for initial therapy, usually in patients that are severely compromised with dysphagia and respiratory compromise. It's used in patients that have not responded to other therapies. And I found that it's also very useful in the treatment of immune-mediated uh, necrotizing myopathy. Now, rituximab, which is an anti-CD20 monoclonal antibody, is suggested that this could be used instead of IVIG. It's cheaper. However, there are not a lot of clues, or at least there's not studies to prove its benefit. Cyclophosphamide, this is a cytotoxic drug, and this is a medicine that we causes side effects that we typically think about when chemotherapy is used. There can be hair loss, there can be profound suppression of the bone marrow, there can be a lot of nausea associated with this. It tends to, to be used in lower doses than in cancer, but still a lot of the side effects can occur. It is used when multiple other treatments have failed myositis. It tends to be used more often also if there's interstitial lung disease and it's been shown to be a, useful in the treatment of scleroderma lung disease.
However, again, this is typically further down the treatment list. So lastly, I'd like to just mention what I think is an exciting new possibility for therapy, and that's chimeric antigen receptor T cells to CD19. Basically, these are T cells that have been used to remove immune system B cells. This is similar to the strategy in the use of rituximab, which is an antibody to remove B cells. However, in this case, we're using the cellular immunity to initiate the immune response as opposed to the immune uh, humoral immunity. And this seems to result in a much longer and more profound B cell suppression, much longer improvement in disease remission. And there is one study suggesting that it does have possible benefit in systemic lupus, systemic sclerosis, and inflammatory myositis. So I hope to see more studies done with this. This is just recent, and again, I've referenced it in the footnotes at the bottom of my lecture notes. Lastly, I want to talk about the treatment of inclusion body myositis. This condition is much more refractory to medicine. Indeed, some would argue not to use medicine at all in the treatment. Usually, I would initiate a trial of corticosteroids to see if they would respond. Likewise, I would consider the addition of methotrexate or azathioprine. However, if these things were not helping, they would be withdrawn. Non-medicinal or adjuncts to therapy are very important, so it's they need to see the speech therapist to work with problems with dysphagia to try, try to avoid reflux problems. Physical therapists can work with strengthening. They can also work with aids or devices to try to prevent falls, such as canes, walkers, or even wheelchairs. And then occupational therapists to get around problems that people have with their daily living associated with this, also with respect to hand strengthening. In conclusion, the inflammatory myopathies are a very varied heterogeneous group of conditions that differ with respect to pathology, extra muscle involvement, and risk to the patient. They are also a very rare group of conditions. They need to be watched carefully to see if there is any risk from the disease from the extra muscle involvement, and the medicines that we use to treat them have side effects. For these reasons, I do feel that this is a specialty disease. These patients should be referred to a rheumatologist or disease specialist that has experience in treating this disease for diagnosis and management. Thank you for coming today to listen to this discussion of idiopathic inflammatory myopathies. I hope you learned something. There are other lectures for sophomore medical students in rheumatology accessed by clicking on my YouTube channel, Introduction to Rheumatology, listed below.